Why did Allah make you? And why did he make me? It's important for us to know this because without knowing it, we will never be able to prepare for the afterlife. We won't even understand that there is an afterlife. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan. When he created us, he has indeed given us instruction. He has told us exactly why he made us. This is Allah. He would never have created us without telling us why we were made. So we've all heard the verses of the Quran and we've all understood that we were created in order to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we've all known that the worshiping of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is connected to obeying the instructions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala more than anything else. And this would mean if I were to lead my life, if I were to lead my life in a way that conformed to the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, or in a way that conformed with the revelation or what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted, then indeed I am successful. And if I were to ignore revelation, then I am a failure. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have not created mankind or jinn kind except that they may worship me or that they worship me. So we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taught us that he has created for us heaven, jannah that is awaiting, something beyond this life. And evidence of it is the fact that from amongst us, there were people who were more powerful than us who have already gone. There were people who had more wealth than us who have already left us. There were people who were far more higher than us in terms of authority, yet they have gone. Where did they go? It's a very important question. Why am I becoming old by the day? Why is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making me become old such that there comes a time when perhaps if Allah has given us the chance to live that long, when I'm 70, perhaps 75, 80, maybe a little bit beyond that, if Allah has allowed us to get to that, you find the health is no longer as it was when we were in our teens and just beyond. So there has to be a reason. And the loser is he or she who thinks that it's okay, we don't need to think about it. You're losing. Today we are, for example, say the average age of those seated here might be 25, 30, perhaps, perhaps, I'm just guessing. Thumb sucks, see all the older people smiling, mashallah. Yes, 25 to 30, perhaps. To be honest, why are we not as fit as we were when we were 18, for example? It's Allah who tells us that we will continue to show you that you were actually created for a greater purpose, and that is to prepare for the day you, you are going to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anyone who is conscious of the fact that he's going to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will definitely be successful because that will lead you to preparing for that day. If I know that subhanAllah, I'm meeting the president or the leader or the Amir or the Sheikh or anyone else, I'm going to meet, for example, uh, a potential spouse, mashallah, I will make sure that I am prepared for the occasion. I will make sure that the day I go, I present myself as I would like to be looked at and as I would like to be understood. The same applies with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but much more importantly, I want to meet with Allah. Who wants to meet with Allah? We all do. We all should be. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He too wants to meet with those who want to meet Him. Subhanallah. Man ahabba liqa Allah, ahabba Allahu liqa. Whoever who loves or is looking forward to with a good heart, the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah loves to meet that person as well. And this is why a way to meet with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clear in the Quran. And it would be wrong for us if we didn't make mention of this verse in Surah Al-Kahf towards the end, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whoever would like to meet with Allah, whoever is looking forward to the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they need to do certain things. What are these things? 
two things are made mention of at the end of this verse or in this beautiful verse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَلْيَعْمَلْ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا Such a person who wants to meet with Allah, looking forward to meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, should do good deeds. What are good deeds? Good deeds are the deeds that are taught to us by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we always come to the point that acts of worship are supposed to have been taught to us by the one who was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the very same mission on his shoulder. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent to us in order to teach us how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So any act of worship that we would like to do, let's make sure that that act of worship was taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If it wasn't, and if we think we know better, and we think we would like to do an act of worship, but just because a few people who have beards are doing it, wallahi, we stand a chance to lose. We need to prepare for the life after. Look at the topic we have this evening. It says the afterlife. Are you prepared? The reality is a lot of us are not prepared, but preparation is taught to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do I prepare for the afterlife? By making sure that the acts of worship I am engaging in are the ones that are correct, upright and taught by the messenger. Why is he called a messenger? Because he brought the message. What was the message? The message was how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And obviously part of it would include what is prepared for those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, we will speak about some of that this evening as well. But if we think that we know better, and if we think that we can do our own things, uh, and things that were not taught by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that sound good to our ears, we should remember that we are not preparing for the life after death. We are actually pre preparing for a loss. We are actually preparing for failure. We are actually preparing in the wrong direction altogether. Because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the one who came to teach us. If we are to go against those teachings, we stand to lose. Similarly, if we take a look at the last part of that verse, where Allah says, وَلَا يُشْرِكْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning us about polytheism to worship besides Allah or with Allah some other deities to have a belief in your heart that someone has one of the qualities or names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala someone is equivalent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in some way or another the minute we believe that we're losing why because Allah says وَلَا يُشْرِكْ a person who, who is looking forward to meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not engage in any form of polytheism. And today we have a sickness. Sometimes when you talk about shirk, when you talk about association of partnership with Allah and the forms that it takes, people start saying, no, this person here is astray. They're not letting us do what we want. But wallahi, all our speech should rotate around. All our speech should rotate around the acts of worship we are engaging in. Are they correct? And who exactly are we worshipping? If I'm worshipping anyone besides my maker, I'm at loss. I haven't prepared for the day I'm going to die. Because when I die, the person whom I was worshipping, we will find that person in a similar pit sometimes. If that person was not a good person, and even if they were good, we would find them also in need of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Take a look at the narration where uh, the messengers are made mention of on the day of Qiyamah when everyone will want help and they will be seeking some form of intercession and they will go to the various messengers asking for help, some form of help and each one of them will say, you know what? I'm concerned about myself. I'm worried about myself. Each one will be saying, myself, I have my own deeds to worry about because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has it that way until we get to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he has been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day to intercede of, on behalf of those who worshipped Allah alone and who tried their best but they may have a few deeds that were that they were not proud of or that would perhaps on the day of judgment be such that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be able to speak to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that connection and in that regard. And from this, we understand two or three very important points. One is, right now and right here, who am I? I'm a worshipper of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
I'm not a worshiper of any messenger, nor am I a worshiper of any creature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm not a worshiper of any grave, nor am I a worshiper of a stick or a stone. I understand that I owe my allegiance to Allah. And I understand that I owe my allegiance to my maker, the one who made me. And I understand that I'm going to return to him. And I also know that he sent a messenger to teach us what is right and wrong, not so that we can worship the messenger. That's how the Christians faltered. What did they do? A messenger came to them in order to take them out of uh, the darkness and bring them to the light. And that messenger was Jesus, may peace be upon him, Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. And as time passed, they began to worship the messenger until they called him the God. Until whenever they were hurt or injured up to this day, whenever they want something meaningful, they first turn to the messenger, Jesus may peace be upon him. So the whole table has turned and everything has gone upside down. They were taught to worship Allah. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, quite clearly towards the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمَ أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَهَيْنِ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ قَالَ سُبْحَانَكَ مَا يَكُونُ لِي أَنْ أَقُولَ مَا لَيْسَ لِي بِحَقَّ He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to Jesus may peace be upon him on that day, on the day of judgment, that, O oh, Isa, did you tell these people to worship you and your mother besides Allah? And he will respond to say, no ways, glory be to you, all praise is due to you, O oh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How could I have told them something that I have no right to tell them? I told them to worship you alone, subhanallah, without associating partners. So this is Isa alayhi salam, Jesus may peace be upon him on the day of judgment disassociating himself from those who worshipped him and he says as, as the Quran says that he will say on that particular day I did not tell them to worship me nor did I tell them to worship my mother I told them to worship you alone O Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the same applies to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says it quite clearly in the hadith towards the end of his life La tutruni kama atratin nasara ibn Maryam walakin qulu abdullahi wa rasuluhu do not go beyond the limits with me, just like the Christians have gone beyond the limits with Jesus, may peace be upon him. Don't do that to me. This was his worry. It was his concern. So what did he say? He said, remember to say, Abdullahi wa Rasuluhu. The, the, I am the worshipper of Allah and his messenger. And this is why in Salah, when we fulfill our Salah, what do we say in that tashahud, in the last part of the prayer? We say, Subhanallah, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammadin kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim innaka hamidun majid. We are asking Allah to send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the same way that he blessed the Prophet Abraham may peace be upon him. And we clearly say that he is a messenger, abduhu wa rasuluhu, that he is the messenger. He is abdullahi wa rasuluhu. When we call out the adhan, what is uttered? أشهد أن محمد رسول الله. Have you heard that? I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. We didn't say he's a part of Allah. He's the one whom we are supposed to be calling out to, you know, against Allah or besides Allah or together with Allah. No. So this is why the issue of intercession that I made mention of a few minutes ago is important. It is حق. It is the truth. Yes, he will definitely have the ability to intercede on behalf of those who have committed sin from amongst the ummah, on behalf of those who are from his ummah. So to qualify for the intercession, number one, you need to be from the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Number two, Allah needs to approve it subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without the approval of Allah, no one will be able to be interceding or no one will be able to be interceded on behalf of and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's approval is important. We read Ayatul Kursi, don't we? I'm sure the bulk of us, a lot of us would know it off by heart. In Ayatul Kursi, Allah says it quite clearly. But we don't know the meaning of that. So we are stuck. 
We read it, mashallah, for protection. It's important thrice in the morning, in the evening. We are taught to do that. So we want protection from shaitan. But we don't understand because we haven't looked at the meaning of it. Sometimes our acts of worship are contaminated. So the, the, that verse, Allah is telling us quite clearly that nobody can intercede on behalf of anyone else except with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why in another narration, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam makes it quite clear where he says that, yes, I will see you at the pond, meaning in the akhirah, I will see you at a specific place. And the Prophet sallallahu speaks of the day of judgment and he says, I will recognize the members of my ummah. What will be the sign? How will I recognize them? You know, today you look at people and mashallah, uh, you can guess their nationality and you can actually say, oh, my brother, do you come from the Philippines? And he will say, yes, I do. How do you know? OK, it's written all over your face. Mashallah, you know, you mashallah. Do you come, for example, from Nigeria? Yes, Alhamdulillah. How do you know? OK, it doesn't need a rocket scientist to know, but some you won't know. Subhanallah, I could have given a million dollars to people to guess my nationality. People wouldn't have guessed. Well, now, you know, mashallah. So the truth is, there is a sign through which Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will recognize the members of his ummah. Do you want to know what it is? I'd love him to recognize me and inshallah we hope he will and we hope he will recognize you. The hadith speaks of the washing of the places of wudu. When you make wudu, when you make your ablution so many times a day and the washing of those places of wudu subhanallah will create a shine. A shine on those beautiful places, mashallah. You know, I've washed the places of wudu. So the Prophet ﷺ recognizes the people, you know, and as they are coming, there may be other means of recognizing that Allah will have blessed him with, but he will say, Oh Allah, this is a, this is a man of my ummah. This is a person of my ummah, male or female. This is a person of my ummah. And he will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive them and Allah will forgive them, subhanallah. And they will be granted Jannah, just like that. That is, the, that is if Allah allows that, if Allah permits it, each one individual, then there will come a person whom the Prophet sallallahu says, ha, minni wa min ummati. This person is from me, my ummah. And he will be told, not this one. You don't know what this person has done after you left. Subhanallah. He continued or she continued to turn their, his back or her back against what you taught. They did something totally different. You taught one thing, this person did something else. And that will be an embarrassment. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ has warned us of this to say, continue to strive. You want the intercession of Muhammad ﷺ, you need to try. You need to try hard. You need to learn. You need to use your time, your effort, your energy, whatever Allah has blessed you with to prepare for that day in conformity to what Muhammad ﷺ has come with. For example, I have a lot of wealth, a lot of wealth, Alhamdulillah. If I have a lot of wealth, how can I convert this temporary item I've been blessed with into a permanent item of the life after? I need, I want to convert it. Look, I've got something temporary known as life, this life. It's very temporary. It only lasts 70 years on average, 60 to 70 years. Wallahi, if this life was the only thing I had to enjoy, it would have been far longer by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's only 60, 70 years. If really this life was the only thing I had, and if really Allah wanted us to enjoy absolutely, you know, in this life, do as you wish, you only live once. I'm sure you've heard that so many times. YOLO, you know, the youngsters say that a lot. You only live once, do as you wish, as you want. Allah would have given us a minimum of a thousand years. Trust me, the reason is it would have been something Allah says, look, I've just made you for fun just so that you can enjoy it. Go and have fun. You won't really get sick because you can enjoy. And you know what? He who has the biggest and greatest fun, he who can dance the best, he who can attract the opposite sex the most, and he who can, you know, really have the most in terms of wealth, whether he's got it by borrowing or stealing or whatever else is, will be the happiest from amongst you. That's what would have been said. If this life was the only purpose, then that's what would have happened. But what proves to us that that is actually untrue is that we all know that life is temporary. 60, 70 years later, even Bill Gates will not be here. Subhanallah. Anyone else? Forget about Bill Gates. That's far. What about us? You know, today I received a message and inshallah, I, I'd like to share it with you. And I, I, I want to actually word it and share it with everyone. And that is 
Today we are living in an age of technology. Do you agree? A lot of you have your mobile phones right here. Agree? A lot of us are more worried, really more worried about the life of the battery of our phone than we are about our own lives. It's a fact. I made sure that I charged my phone. The minute it comes down, it, it, it has to get a charge again. The minute it comes a little bit down, it gets a charge again. Then you can buy spare batteries or you can buy technology or the external battery. We are all worried because we are foolish to have a phone without battery power. You know, it's got a battery in it and it needs power. Go to any airport. They have prayer rooms. Sorry, not prayer rooms. I'm talking of battery bank charges. It's a prayer room for the phone. We need to charge ourselves five times a day as well. Charge your spirituality. Remember your battery starts dwindling and you start thinking things you're not supposed to think because you didn't read your salah, your link with Allah. You did not do istighfar. Listen to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We don't want to call it a battery because that's incorrect. But you understand the example I'm giving you. He used to, as the hadith says, Kana yastaghfirullaha mi'ata marra. He used to ask Allah's forgiveness a hundred times a day, more than 70 times a day, according to the narrations. What is that? That is charging oneself. I'm asking you to do that to prepare for the life after. Then you can ask yourself, am I prepared? You say, inshallah, I hope in the mercy of Allah, I tried my best. May Allah forgive me for my shortcomings. Here I am, I'm going. That's preparation for the life after. Subhanallah. So we are more interested in our phones and their li the, the, the life of the laptop and the iPod and, and so on because we have made a plan so that we are not caught unawares. It's a fact. Why don't we make a plan when it comes to our salah, when it comes to goodness, you stay away from sin for the sake of Allah forcefully for a period of time. There will come a time when it will be so easy for you to achieve that. You know, when a person has been engaged in bad things in their life and so on, there will come a day when you are tapped by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somehow some need and you understand, hey, I need to turn to Allah. Hey, it's about time I did, you know, I'm going to die. I cannot continue in this evil way. And then your heart is cleansed. Initially, it will be difficult to quit pornography. It will be difficult to quit perhaps adultery. It will be difficult to quit the gambling and the casinos. It might be difficult to quit something or to start fulfilling your salah or to start dressing appropriately or to make an effort to attend lessons because it's through the lessons that are, you know, specialized that we will be able to increase our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will be difficult at the beginning, but if you compel yourself, if you force yourself initially ask Allah's help continue to ask his help Oh Allah help me to abstain from haram Oh Allah strengthen me when it comes to fulfilling my duties towards you Oh Allah create a barrier between myself and haram in a way that it's not done Ya Allah and and with that strengthen yourself you find the first time second time mashallah you will be happy with yourself but shaitan might come and tap you because you are still fresh still fresh you know the concrete is still wet so shaitan is trying he taps you again what is he trying to make you do he's trying to make you forget the bigger picture and what is the bigger picture the life after that's the bigger picture it is the eternal life those who have died have died for longer than they were alive think of that a man who lived 70 years and died 700 years ago has already died longer than he was ever alive so he is in dire need of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is eternal now now the next life when we go from this one to the next one that is completely eternal and that is what we have to prepare for so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us prepare for that life and part of the preparation is to understand that the temporary nature of every single thing we have in this life everything what do you have today I was reading of a couple who were the happiest ever they had three children and mashallah so delighted so happy and they never ever dreamt that anything would go wrong in their lives subhanallah you know we call it going wrong but it's not going wrong it's only reality that's what it is it's reality Allah has not kept this life for everything to move smooth really if if we had to enjoy everything would have been smooth but Allah keeps on reminding you, you've got a problem financially. Why? Because Allah says, turn to me. Remember, this is temporary. Come to me. Subhanallah. So what happened with the family? Suddenly one day the husband passed away. Sudden heart attack and gone. And the wife says, my life changed drastically, immediately, in a way that I could not believe. I could not believe. Subhanallah. I, I didn't know. 
And this is really a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you cannot blame Allah for taking your husband away. He can go. Guess what? Subhanallah, this life was always temporary. It's just that you didn't understand. That's what it is. And we are all on our own. You know, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the afterlife, there are verses in the Quran that we can recite one after the other that explain quite clearly that on the day of Qiyamah, everyone will be worried. They will be concerned. They will be really, they will be such that subhanallah, they will forget their loved ones. Allah speaks of how everyone will be running away from those whom they were so close to in the world. Running away. I don't need to know about my brother. I don't need to know about my friend. I don't need to know about my parents, my children, my spouse. No, I don't want to know about anyone. Everyone will have his or her own worry and concern. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us on that day. May he be with us. So even in this life, remember, prepare for it with whatever Allah has blessed you with. Like we said, you have your wealth. It's not forever. You have your health. It's not forever. You have free time. It's not forever. You will be occupied. You have, for example, your, you know, your young days when you are within your youth, it's not going to remain forever. It ends. It comes to an end. I achieve a lot of lesson by looking at all the people who can barely walk and asking them about their life. And a lot of them have done more than I have. And yet today they are old. They can't walk. Subhanallah. And I start thinking I was young one day. I used to look in the mirror and say, Subhanallah, you know what? You're still 25. I'm no longer 25. I'm old. Subhanallah. And everyone is growing much older. So it's not doom and gloom. You know, sometimes if I if I can call it that, there might be another better word. Perhaps I've chosen not to use it. Has progressed in such a way that sometimes shaitan uses it to make us forget the bigger picture and to look at the bigger picture as a point of depression that must never be spoken about. Wallahi. So when someone says you're going to die, you say, look at this guy, he's dooming me. And then you're back in the clubs with your skirts and with everything else and your drink and whatever else. But brother, you die in that club. That's what it is. People have died wherever. Do you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's decree? Yes. That is what will take you. When your time is up, you can have been anywhere, anywhere. Your time is up, it doesn't delay. When the fixed prescribed time of Allah, appointed time comes, it will not be delayed. No delay. When their time comes, they will not be delayed by an hour, by a moment, and they will not be brought forward by a moment. It is the time. That is the speci specified time. It's up to us to understand when Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatih wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. O you who believe, be conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way that he deserves, meaning the level of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Try your best to be conscious of Allah on the highest possible level. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us. You know, the Quran says, Fattakullaha mastata'atum. Be conscious of Allah as best as you can. And then the, the ayah says, and do not die except in the condition of Islam, of submission. One might say, well, how do I know on what condition I'm going to die? I don't know. Technically, that answer might be right. But if you take a look at the deeper meaning of the verse, it is encouraging you and I to lead our entire lives submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way, in a way that if we were to die at any given time, we would die in a good condition. 
if your life is full of goodness, you know, morning, mashallah, you leave the home, you read the dua, you travel to your workplace, in your workplace, you are kind to everyone, mashallah, you are conscious of the fact that every moment I get, every opportunity I get, let me convert it into the currency of the akhirah. The currency of the akhirah, good deeds or deeds. So let me, you know, I see my colleagues, I speak to them properly, I respect people, I do the work that I am, you know, supposed to do for people. I don't just make life difficult for them and so on. And then I read my salah on time. I try my best to read the Quran. I understand, I purify myself, I increase my knowledge. I try to practice upon whatever I've learned. When the time of salah comes, I fight my laziness, I get up. And, uh, you know, I might go back home for lunch or if I'm at work for lunch, I only eat that which is halal. I say the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I continue later in the day. I return home. I made sure that I've stopped by the masjid. I've read my salah, gone back home. I've had time for my children. I've put away sin that might be in the form of my telephone and so on. Perhaps just sitting and watching movies. I know that this is a waste of time. I haven't done that. So if I lead my life in this way, that I'm conscious of Allah, I tried my best, I always did good things that were pleasing Allah. The day I die, can I die in a nightclub? That's a question. Can I die with a bottle in my hand when I've never touched a bottle? Can I die, may Allah forgive us and protect us all, committing a sin? Say for example, watching pornography and suddenly heart attack and dead. Is that how I want to go? Well, this ayah which says La tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun, do not die except in the condition of submission, means don't even sin. Stay far from sin so that whenever you die, you will be in the condition of submission. There we are. So this is something very important, preparing for the afterlife in this particular way. Because let me tell you, the day we die, the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, muttafaqun alayh. There are so many narrations which make mention of what will happen when we die. And if you understand that description, Wallahi, you will come to realize that to prepare for that day is far more important than the next meal I'm going to have. It's far more important than the water and drink that I have to prepare for the day when the soul and the body are separated. When the soul and the body are separated in a way that one's life is taken. You see, when we are asleep, there is a certain disconnection between the soul and the body. That is when a person is asleep and it's reconnected when they wake up. But when it's completely taken away in terms of death, when Allah has kept it, you know, the angels are seen and will be seen by every one of us. The angels of death who come to take that soul out, they will come in the form that is either beautiful for the eye or really fearful, such that we are scared to look at them. You choose how you want it. Really, you ask Allah to guide you. And this is why whoever asks Allah's guidance sincerely, Allah will guide them. You know, we say, mustaqim, guide me to the straight path. Yes, Allah has predestined or it has been predestined that we will die in this condition and that condition. But Allah has given us the ability to work in this world. We don't know what is in store for us. That is the beauty of it. Had I known and you had known, and this is sometimes people ask you a question of predestiny. And they say, look, you know what? If it's already known that I'm going to hell, what's the point of all this? The, the simple answer to it is you don't know. Allah knows. So you work. That's a simple, straightforward answer to say, do you know where you're going? No, I don't. Allah knows. Well, if you don't know, work towards what you believe you would like. That's it. And Allah will do the rest. But foolish is a man who says, you know, uh, I, my sustenance is written by Allah. How much I'm going to earn today? Written by Allah not written by me. So let me sit at home and see it will come. Well, in that case, it was written that you were foolish and you did not go. So as a result of that foolishness and your lack of understanding, you now must suffer the consequences of losing your job and so on. How can you not go to work? Get up and go to work. You need to earn at the end of the month. You have bills to pay. But remember, you might not see the end of the month. Why you might die. Then you have a very big bill to pay. Your account will be taken. How much do I have to pay? There is weight of deeds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the scales of justice on that day. Surah Al-Anbiya, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the scales of justice shall be placed. You know, your good deeds, your bad deeds, they are placed on the scale. And whichever one tips the other, so you will be fortunate. Look at the Quran, Surah Al-Qari'ah, where Allah speaks of the, those who have done deeds that are bad and what will happen to them. 
فأما من من فأما من ثقلت موازينه فهو في عيشة راضية وأما من خفت موازينه فأمه هاوية وما أدراك ما هي نار حامية. Normally after that we would hear Allah Akbar. Do you agree? Because we don't know its meaning for us. Narun Hamiya, it means the raka'ah is over now. It's a reality. You know, you're standing here and you hear Narun Hamiya and the guy starts going down. But you don't understand it's speaking of the fire. Allah says, those whose good deeds are, are heavy, they have good news. Subhanallah. They will be given some great place, a place where they will be happy, mashallah. They will have a life that they will be happy with. And those whose scales are of good deeds are light. Oh, they will be going to what is known as Hawiyah. What is that? It is Narun Hamiyah. It is actually a, a punishment. The fire that Allah is describing in that surah, it is scary. But for us, we don't even know the meaning sometimes. And this is why we say, if you want to live a life such that you have prepared for the afterlife, you need to have read the Quran. You need to know what the Quran is all about. You need to re read what Allah says. There is a life after death and definitely there is. And who is going to be a winner? The person who tried. We are all human beings. We all falter. But the best of those who falter are those who repent constantly. So learn to ask Allah's forgiveness. That is one of the best ways of seeking the paradise that Allah has prepared. Seeking forgiveness. Ask Allah's forgiveness every day. And perhaps you will be closer to Jannah. May Allah grant it to us without reckoning. So the angels that will come to take the soul away will come in certain forms depending on what type of person you were. And the way the soul is removed will also depend on the type of person we, we are, the type of people we are. So if, if the person is bad, may Allah not make any one of us from amongst those, the soul is taken out as though it is a rope that has a lot of thorns on it and it is pulled through the throat and it is coming out struggling and the person has a lot of pain and the person is struggling and suffering and that is how it's gone. One might say, why will that happen? Well, that's Allah. I don't have a choice in this regard. It's not from me, not from you. It's Allah's decision. And you know, on that day and even today, we are at the mercy of Allah. That's it. If Allah wants to take us all away right here, right now, he can do it. It doesn't make him bad. It just means we've gone to the real life soon. Mashallah. May Allah make us go to the real life when he knows it's correct for us to go. That dua is not so easy to make because some people say, no, but I want to live a little bit longer. Well, if it's best for you to go at 35, 40, 45, Alhamdulillah, if you missed out another 20 years, big deal, Allahu Akbar, at least you got your eternity. So this is why the Prophet Sallallahu used to make a dua, Allahumma ja'al khaira ayyamina awakhiraha, wa khaira a'malina khawatimaha. Oh Allah, let the best of our days be the last days. Let the best of our deeds be the last deeds we've engaged in so that when we die upon good deeds, we will actually be resurrected upon the good deeds. You die in the condition of salah, by the will of Allah, you will be resurrected in that condition. You die in ihram, you will be resurrected inshallah, bi idnillah, by the will of Allah, in ihram. But you never ever read your salah. What are the chances of you dying in salah? You never, you never attempted to go for hajj. What are the chances of you dying in ihram? And we're not saying you need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, I'm going for hajj. Just take me away there. Do you know? You say, Oh Allah, when you know it's correct for me to go, let me go. And then people say, Ya Allah, don't take me away. I've got kids. So then mashallah, what do you want? I want my kids to grow old. Okay, my kids have grown old. Oh Allah, don't take me away. I want them to get married. Okay, so now you, you are now 60. Your kids are married. Oh Allah, don't take me away. I want to see my grandchildren. Okay, see your grandchildren, no problem. Okay, then you say, Oh Allah, I've seen my grandchildren, but Ya Allah, don't take me away. I want to get them married. And then you, you see them getting married. Oh Allah, I've seen them getting married, but don't take me away. At least I can be a great grandfather. And it carries on and on and on. And a person is never happy. So this is why you know when Allah takes you, He doesn't ask you, should I take you? He takes you. That's it, gone. And when He takes you, you need to know it was the right time for you to go. May Allah make it such that we have good deeds at that particular time. If you have lost out on the upbringing of your grandchildren, if you have not seen your grandchildren, but you will get Jannah, don't worry. By the will of Allah, you will see them there if they have good deeds, inshallah. Don't worry. It's more important for me to get paradise than for me to be with my grandchildren here.
If Allah says, okay, I give you your grandchildren, you will see them and you see your great grandchildren. But what is more important for you to be in paradise or to be with them? Your choice. Allah leaves us with no choice. He takes us as he wishes. So don't be fooled. Prepare for the meeting with Allah. Like we said, we need to make sure whatever we have, you see, we are seated here. I'm sure there are so many people who are listening to us online as well. And there will be others who will listen to this later again. May Allah bless us all, really. May Allah grant us all Jannah. We all want it. Jannah is not something that I can say, okay, guys, you know what? If I'm going there, I'm going to make sure you're not there. That's not how it works. Because in this dunya, we have, you know, we have a power struggle in the world. When it comes to paradise, you make a dua for others to earn paradise. The angels make that dua for you. You ask Allah to grant the others paradise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may grant that to you as a result of your prayer for others. May Allah make us people who are generous. You know, this world, sometimes people have small problems. And because of the problem, you say, you know, this, this person has really troubled me. I just wish they're not in Jannah. What guarantee do you have? You're going to be in Jannah. What if they are making a dua to say, oh Allah, this person has hassled me a lot. Let us get to Jannah because I know that in Jannah they won't hassle. Wow, what a nice way of looking at it. Same applies to spouses. You know, there is a huge debate. It's a storm in a teacup. What's the storm in the teacup? People say, will I have the same spouse I have here in heaven? And they spoil their face. You know, when they ask you, will I have my spouse in heaven? You know that it means something good. And when they say, will I have the same man that I had here for 30 years? Will I have him there as well? You know, there was something wrong. It's the expression on the face that gives it away. And you got to look at them and you got to say, Yes, you know, and then they look at you and say, what? what? Can't I have someone else? Well, what if I told you that he'll be the top shot, best person available there completely? What are you going to say? I can't believe that, man. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. So I always say, because people debate, okay, so men will have this. What will women have? And women will have that. So what will men have? Hang on. We're losing focus. Understand? The main aim is to get there. After that, Allah says, Speaking of Jannah, Allah says, In it, whatever a, a soul desires, that soul shall have. What you desire, you will have. So I cannot desire now and decide, hey, when I go to Jannah, I'm not going to want this man and I'm not going to want this woman. I'm going to want the other lady who's down the road there. You cannot decide here and now because you first need to get to Jannah. You need to have the mind that will be given to you complete. That will be in Jannah of Jannah of the people of the Akhirah. We cannot describe beyond what Allah has told us. But what we do know is when that happens and then you choose something. Here's the verse of the Quran. You can hold it because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made it clear that you can, you can hold Allah to his promise. Subhanallah. If Allah has promised you something, you can hold him to that promise. You can say, Ya Allah, I worked and I worked so hard. Here was your promise in the Quran. Ya Allah, give. You won't even need to say that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not such that he will go against what he's promised you. Inna Allah la yukhliful mi'ad. You know, Allah will not go against that appointed, whatever he has promised or appointed in any way. No ways, not at all. So people start asking, you know, what will I have? Remember, in the process of the discussion of what you are going to actually have, a lot of the times we lose focus of actually getting there. That's the thing. So what's the point of a person who's not dressed appropriately? They're not reading Salah. They're not doing, and they say, you know what? If, I'm, if, that's what I'm, if that's what I'm going to get in Jannah, then I don't even want to waste my time preparing for it. That is the devil. He's got hold of you because when you get there, you will never be let down. Subhanallah. I was reading just before I came. In fact, I was on the metro a few moments ago and I was reading a book that I had with me. And there's a hadith, subhanallah, amazing. It's good to refresh your mind all the time. And speaking of the last person who will enter Jannah, the last person. And amazingly, amazingly, it says the person will be given not just equivalent to the entire dunya and what it had, but that 10 times, 10 times. Imagine today, take a look at what the dunya has. And to be honest with you, 
this is only a description to bring it close to the mind because nothing that we've got in this world qualifies to come to the akhirah. Not the beautiful perfumes, not the technology completely. No WhatsApp in paradise, remember this. No, not at all. Anything you've thought of, any phones and iPhones and whatever, no ways. So if someone says, I'm not going to have my games in heaven. Ooh, what's, what am I going to do there? I'll be bored. You haven't thought. You haven't even thought for a minute. You know, we are being occupied with so many things here. It's not going to come. Imagine everything of value in this world, if it was yours and yours alone, and you were the boss and the king of, of whatever was there, every single thing, whether it, no matter what it is, imagine it was yours. And the hadith says, multiply that by 10 and convert it to that which is in heaven. So it's not the cheap stuff of, the, of this world. You put a battery in your phone, the battery goes. You use the phone for a while, it stops functioning. Something happens, you know, you start wilting. Jannah is not like that. You don't wilt. You are at a beautiful age. It's reported that the age of 33, a certain height, beauty, beauty. You look how you want to look, subhanallah. How do you want to look? Mashallah, you look like that. Now what do you want? That's the afterlife. What's the point of talking about all this when we haven't even prepared for it? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us really. And this is why it's important for us to know that reading about heaven and hell should mainly make us focus upon achieving heaven and staying away from hell. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe the people of hellfire? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and this is the life after. وَنَادَى أَصْحَابُ النَّارِ أَصْحَابَ الْجَنَّةِ أَنْ أَفِيضُوا عَلَيْنَا مِنَ الْمَاءِ أَوْ مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ اللَّهِ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ حَرَّمَهُمَا عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ الَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا دِينَهُمْ لَهُوًا وَلَعِبًا وَغَرَّتْهُمُ الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا فَالْيَوْمَ نَنْسَاهُمْ كَمَا نَسُوا لِقَاءَ يَوْمِهِمْ هَذَا وَمَا كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَجْحَدُونَ On that day, the people of hellfire will call out to the people of heaven asking them to pour on them some water or liquid, anything that Allah has bestowed you with, pour it on us. We are struggling, we are suffering, we are being burnt, we are struggling in such a way that this heat is immense and intense. Pour on us something that Allah has given you. And the people of Jannah will say, that's one thing we are not allowed to do. Allah has prohibited that against those who disbelieve, they belie. You knew what was right, you turned away. And Allah says, on this day, nansahum, we will forget them in the same way that they forgot us. Where did they forget us? When they were in the world, we sent them messages. We sent them messengers. We sent them reminders. We, we made sure that we created them in a way that they knew that they're going to leave the world, but they didn't prepare for the day they left. Subhanallah. Today, let's be honest. A lot of us here are expatriates. Why are we in Dubai? Have you ever asked yourself the question? People might say, well, you know, I've been here because we need to do business and I need to earn. I've got a job, beautiful place, mashallah, what, nice to earn. And so many things that are good that are happening. But why are we here? Because we want a certain quality of life. Subhanallah, if we were able to achieve a better quality of life elsewhere, perhaps we wouldn't be here. But mashallah, it's so good that if, if that is your concern for as long as it's within the limits of what Allah has prescribed Alhamdulillah you're doing a good thing but don't forget don't forget at all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept something permanent and that is Jannah do not lose focus upon Jannah even for a specific even for a split moment because if that's the case Wallahi we stand to lose no matter what we've achieved here temporarily that's the word but when you come here mashallah you'll hear the adhan you might not hear it elsewhere so it's up to you now. You can't just say, I came here to earn money. So by the way, I'll read Taraweeh every evening. It's not Ramadan. You can't read Taraweeh every evening. You know what's the meaning of Taraweeh outside Ramadan? People miss their Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib and Isha. Come after Salatul Isha. They say, Allahu Akbar, oh Allah, this is my Fajr. And a little while later, Assalamu Alaikum, I'm feeling so good. This is my Dhuhr, Allah. Hey, there's no Taraweeh outside Ramadan. 
my brother, my sister, there is a time for Salatul Fajr. There is a time for Dhuhr. There is a time for Asr. Remember, when you fulfill it on time, it's one of the first things that you will be asked about as you die. Subhanallah. One of the first things you're going to be questioned about is Salah. As you are taken away, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept in store. And one of the narrations actually makes mention of how the people will be resurrected according to their keenness and interest in Salah. May Allah forgive us. May Allah make us keen with Salah. Those who were in the first saf, those who read Salah as soon as the time entered, they, one of the narrations says they will be resurrected in the first saf, meaning they will be resurrected amongst those who were Salihin, amongst those who were pious, amongst those who had the same interest. Subhanallah. And the others who were lagging behind and so on, may Allah forgive us and may that not be the case with us. Remember one thing, my brothers and sisters, there is something so beautiful that we have. It's a gift. It's the gift of hope. And that gift comes with Tawbah. Tawbah is a gift of Allah. Seeking Allah's forgiveness. Imagine if we were told that when you commit a sin, you can never ever seek forgiveness. You can never ever seek forgiveness. I was reading the newspaper today of some uh, incident that happened where people are told that for you, there's no forgiveness. They, they, no ways. Even if you repeat your shahada, no matter what you do, no forgiveness. Come on, are you Allah? When the mushrikeen of Quraysh, those who took swords in order to harm the Muslims, those who, who tried to strike Rasulullah were forgiven by them accepting the shahada, by them asking for forgiveness and so on. Then who are we to declare that others are not entitled to seeking forgiveness? No way. They are. If you die on the condition or in the condition of association and partnership with Allah, then that's Allah. He's promised that he will penalize such people. But remember, for me and you, the biggest gift is I've done things wrong in my life in the past. I was speaking about marriage a few days ago when I was in Sri Lanka and I made mention of an important point to say a lot of us when we got married, we had functions that were more like, you know, a Satan's ball, really where women are naked, men are naked, alcohol present, people are dancing, things are happening. And, and for you, that's your sacred union of mashallah nikah. And we're celebrating it. And people regret it. Now, 20 years down the line, like I said, you don't obey Allah, don't expect your children to obey you. That's one thing quite clear. If they do, it's a gift of Allah, but there is a way of leveling it. How? Ask Allah's forgiveness. Oh Allah, 30 years ago, I did it very wrong. Ya Allah, forgive me. If I have another opportunity, inshallah, to do for my children and so on, then by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I will do it correct. I will try my best to do it correct. Mashallah. You know, the men, they might think of it differently. See, they're already smiling. Yeah, when I said, if we have another opportunity, inshallah, we'll do it correctly. They'll look at the women and say, see, I'll get another wife now. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, really. It's the way we look at things, the way we understand things. You know, different people look at different things differently. Sometimes you can make a statement that's as straight as ever. And people whose minds are warped cannot see that it's a straight statement. So what can we do? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us all and grant us all the ability to understand reality. So this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have our children. We have things we've done in the past that were wrong. There is a way of coming out of it clean. What is it? Admit you were wrong, regret it, ask Allah's forgiveness and promise not to do it again. Wallahi wiped out, totally wiped out. And guess what? You don't need to go to another human being who's a father or a priest or a sheikh or the imam of the masjid and start confessing your sin. Because who knows that imam might have more sin than you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not let that happen. But he, if he were to tell you, listen, I will give you paradise. He doesn't have a guarantee that he is going into paradise. Where is the guarantee? Subhanallah. People are worried. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, what a powerful man. He was worried. He thought perhaps I might be one of the hypocrites. How would he have thought that? It's only the strength of Iman that makes you think that way. To say, you know what, I've done so much, but I wonder what will happen to me. This is why we are taught, have hope in the mercy of Allah. The hadith Qudsi, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I will treat each one of my worshippers according to how they perceived I would treat them according to their perception of me. You have hope in the mercy of Allah and you've tried the best. Allah in bi'idn al-wahid al-ahad, by his will and mercy, will have mercy on you. He will treat you the way you felt. But if you feel, no, Allah's not going to forgive me. There's no point. You know, I don't need to seek this forgiveness. 
then how do you expect the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Another thing, shaitan comes to us in order to tamper with our afterlife by making us think that, you know what? You asked Allah's forgiveness, but you know, that's not good enough. Not good enough. How? You asked Allah's forgiveness. How can you say that's not good enough? You may repeat the seeking of forgiveness again and again. No problem. You can repeat something. Yes, it's good because you are regretful of it. But don't doubt the mercy of Allah. Not for a moment because you would go against the Quran. Listen to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in a verse in Surah Zumar where Allah, it is known as one of the verses that have the most hope in it. Listen to this beautiful verse. Allah says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ جَمِيعًا إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Messenger, tell my worshippers who have transgressed against themselves. This shows us that when you sin, it's against you, not against Allah. Allah doesn't need my act of worship. It's me who needs it. So remember this. The verse is saying, Oh, you who have transgressed against yourselves. What should you know? Never lose hope in the mercy of Allah. That means if you are losing hope, you are going against Allah. How can you lose hope? Don't think I'm a write off. You are alive, aren't you? Well, then ask Allah's forgiveness. You are breathing, aren't you? You are. Well, ask Allah's forgiveness because the very next verse Allah says, وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ وَأَسْلِمُوا لَهُ مِن قَبْلِ أَن يَأْتِيَكُمُ الْعَذَابِ Turn to Allah. Repent. Surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quickly before the punishment overtakes you. One, there are two verses. One of them says, before the punishment overtakes you suddenly, and you didn't even realize. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May Allah help us to prepare for that day. So on that day, it will be a difficult day. When we die, we ask Allah to grant us a good death. Those who die with good words on their tongues, Allah has promised them goodness. Those who die with goodness on their tongues, Allah has promised them goodness. And those who die with bad words on their tongue, what do you expect? You know the hadith says, Man kana akhiru kalamihi min dunya la ilaha illallah dakhal al jannah. Whoever has the statement on their tongues as the last words before they die, la ilaha illallah. You know there is no God worthy of worship besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at these beautiful words. Such a person will achieve jannah. How will we be able to utter those words if every time we get hurt, we say a swear word? Every time something happens to us, we are so angry that we just start uttering words that we don't even know. Get used to Allahu Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Subhanallah. I don't know if you've heard the latest interpretation of LOL. Have you heard it? Subhanallah. We all use it LOL, LOL. No one laughs because when we type it LOL, LOL, we, do, we don't even laugh. So I was suggesting when you say LOL, just say La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. It's also an LOL, subhanallah. But to be honest, it depicts the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah alone, the all powerful, the almighty. Something bad happens, say La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We belong to Allah, we're going to return to him. This is what will grant us goodness. Learn to utter the shahada. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Several times a day, each time you make wudu, it's a sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Repeat these words: Allahumma jalni min al tawabin, wa jalni min al mutatahirin. Oh Allah, make me from amongst those who constantly repent, and oh Allah, make me from amongst those who are cleansed. And inshallah, you'll be able to prepare for the year after. This is a way of preparing, because Subhanallah, if the end is good. The rest of it, inshallah, will be good. If a person has committed sin for 70 years and the end, he repents and he turns to Allah, that 70 years will be wiped out. Allah's mercy is such that he says, those who have committed sin and repent to me and do good deeds, those sins will be converted into deeds that are on the right side of the scale. Good deeds, subhanallah. That's Allah. And that's the plan of Allah. His mercy is far greater than we can imagine. Today, if you have a person who's kind and merciful and so on, 
they cannot compete with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is much more merciful. Once the Prophet sallallahu passing with his companions and they saw a woman breastfeeding and he asks the question, do you see this woman casting this little child of hers into hell? They said, no. So he said, well, Allah is more merciful upon each one of you than that woman is upon that little child of hers, which means subhanallah, we need to try. We need to hope in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person who goes down into their grave after the soul has gone and they are in their grave. Imagine what will be the condition of an individual there. We believe that there is something known as you know, the, the grave being made narrow. How is it going to be made narrow? Allah knows, but we believe it. It's, it's going to happen because it's there. The Prophet ex explained it to us that that, you know, tightening or the narrowing of that grave, what will happen and how the person will be tested so much and how they will be questioned in that grave. It's the truth. The angels will come and they will seat the individual. How it will happen, Allah knows best, but the questions are going to be asked by the angels. Who is your Rabb? Who is your Nabi? What is your Deen? And so on. And it's no good for us to say, well, I know the answers every day in the morning. I used to say it 20 times. That's not good enough. If you were following, you will be able to answer. And if you are not following, you won't be able to answer. So here is the mu'min, the one who was believing, he will answer just like that. And he will be given a good resting place. You know, a, a little perhaps breeze of heaven will be released for that person because of the goodness that the person engaged in, in, in his or her life. And the other person, the evil person who engaged in bad and did not turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will say or she will say, you know what? Who is your Rabb? Who is your Nabi? What is your Deen? And so on. Oh. Yeah, I, I heard people saying something and I used to say something as well. That's what sometimes we are guilty of. Do you know how? We heard people reading the Quran. We just read it. That's all. We just said the same thing without even thinking. What's the meaning of it? What is it? What is this work? What is how can I live my entire life without knowing what my maker said? What a fool. Allahu Akbar. I need to know it because when I die, that Sheikh who told me it's haram to look at the meaning of the Quran, he's not going to be there with me to say, Oh Allah, I was the one who told this, this chap here not to read the meaning. What do you think? It was you, your brain, your mind Allah gave you. You are responsible, you are answerable. Start understanding Allah's plan by reading his book. He's, that's the only book that is valid in existence. Subhanallah, it will lead you to the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But if you don't have that book, you don't know what it's all about. What do you expect? How are you going to prepare for the Akhirah? My brothers and sisters, it's an important message. The preparation for the life after death is the most important thing that I need to prepare for. You know, we will all invest our wealth because we want, mashallah, high rise building and a little apartment. We will go out and get loans, inshallah, hope they are halal, inshallah. But from wherever we get some loans and we want to, uh, you know, pay back over time because I need to own the house. Do you know what's happening? And I have seen this in a lot of cases of people who've passed away. They took out loans. They wanted big apartments or homes for their families and themselves. Before they could pay back the loan, they were already in need of a palace in the hereafter because they died. So what happens to, the, to that loan? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Allah Allahu Akbar. Who is there who is going to give to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that that loan would be multiplied so many fold? Subhanallah. Are you ready to do for Allah? Spend your time for Allah. Spend your energy for Allah. Abstain from sin for the sake of Allah. You will find its reward multiplied when you need your palace in the Akhirah. It will be there. You will already be given glad tidings of it from the moment the angels come to take your soul away. You've been, you've been given glad tidings because you, you now know, subhanallah, you have an idea that so the angels that have come are angels that I've seen. One narration makes mention and it's muttafaq alayh that the angels, the person who's dying will see the angels and just the angels and subhanallah, they up to the horizon, wherever the person can see, they will just see this angel, subhanallah. And, and the angel will come in white, white. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make that day easy for us. I mean, ask Allah to grant us goodness. People have died. 
and people who did not believe that there was a hereafter are already in the hereafter. What fools, subhanallah. People who did not believe in the hereafter are already in the hereafter. They've gone. Where are we going? Prepare for the grave. People will come, they'll bury you, they'll carry you. Like I always say, there will come a day when the phones will be ringing, the messages will be flying, people will be tweeting and WhatsApping, and people will be putting posters and statuses and so on regarding your death. The day is coming. The day is definitely coming. People will phone. How many times have you received a phone call and a message? Someone you knew, close to you. They say, Inna lillah, the person's gone. Ah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. How? What happened? Sometimes we are shocked. Shocked? Well, you know what? A bigger shock will be if you were just taken without preparation. That's a bigger shock. May Allah help us. Because when I go, I'm all alone. If you look at your children carefully, and your parents and your brothers carefully, they belong to Allah before they were even connected to you. But Allah used you to bring them into existence in order to fulfill the bigger plan that he has. That's what it is. But otherwise, Allah owns your child and you do not. Do you know that? Because you have to look after the gift of Allah as a test from Allah in order to earn paradise through the gift of Allah. I have a temporary, I have a child temporarily known as my child here in this world. Inshallah, if I use that temporary opportunity to prepare for heaven, I will be getting Jannah solely because of my sacrifice. Same applies with marriage. You're married to someone, it's temporary. But you can eternalize it in certain ways, if Allah wills. Subhanallah. For now, Subhanallah, I need to use this gift of Allah that I have by treating her or him in such a way that I earn Jannah. I, I prepare for my afterlife. It's a sacrifice. It's not easy. And we tell people and now we need to tell them more and more because materialism is taking over. And we tell people, you know what? Marriage is a big sacrifice, a huge sacrifice. Without sacrifice, you won't achieve anything. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to sacrifice in a way that he is pleased with us. So let's prepare for the day we are put down when our families will return. And what is left? The hadith speaks of how when a person is, you know, in the form of a janazah, in the form of a dead person being carried, who follows this person? Family, wealth, deeds following this person. They buried and some things go back and some things stay. What goes back? The family goes back. Before you know it, your wife is married again. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. You know, it reminds me, and I must pause for a moment on a lighter note. It reminds me of a person who was really upset in his marriage and so on. And, you know, they were not happy. And so something happened and, so, you know, the relationship began to improve and they were working on it and what have you. So the man asks his wife, if I die, will you marry again? That's a question. Imagine, you know, people make their promises as much as they want, but you do not know the circumstances of your spouse. Say, for example, you died and your spouse is struggling so much and they need some form of help. No one's coming to help them. They wouldn't be wrong to marry again. In fact, it's encouraged to marry again, subhanallah. But at the same time, listen to what the spouse says. The woman says, when the husband says, will you marry again? So she says, no, no. So what will you do? I'll just stay with my sister. Okay, wow, good answer. And a little while later she asked, what about you? Will you marry again? He says, no. So what will you do? I'll also just stay with your sister. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We are ready to make a plan for when our spouse is dying, but we haven't made a plan for when we die. Have you thought of what I'm saying? We make a plan. We already know if she dies, hey, I've got another two, three lined up, mashallah. And we don't know, brother, you're dying before her. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to prepare. May Allah help us to prepare, really. This is something that we need to think about. So I was saying, your deeds are the only things that remain with you. 
Otherwise your wealth goes back. Your children are fighting over it. They've stopped talking to each other over it. They have broken the family into 20 pieces over your wealth. Ask those whom this has happened to. They will confirm, yes, it's correct. And what has happened? They, that wealth, had you not left it, perhaps your family might have been closer bonded than now that you had a lot of wealth. I know of people who've had nothing. And after the death, the family is so close, mashallah. And I know of people who've had so much that when the person passes away, someone is trying to rob this one and the other one is denying that one and this one is claiming his share of inheritance and the other one comes and say that was mine and I worked with dad and I did this and it was me and debates go on. Yes, there are exceptions to that. There are people who've died, mashallah, wealthy and even their children, mashallah, have been happy thereafter. But the message here is what you've amassed in terms of wealth and what you have had in terms of relatives. You've had 20, 30, 50 children. Trust me, they will go back. Before you know it, they will forget you. Look. We are seated here. How many of you know your seventh forefather? I don't know why they called him forefathers. One day when I was young, I used to think the reason why they called him forefathers is you can only remember up to four of them. After that, you can't remember. That's a forefather. You remember your forefathers? You say, yes, all four of them. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. But one wonders, it's a fact. You will not remember your forefather. How many of us know seven generations back? But they were important people. You are from their lineage and you don't even know about them. They, why? You are their family. But you, they went, they left you behind, gone. The wealth that they had, well, too late. Subhanallah. You might have a piece of land somewhere in one of the rural areas of some place you come from. That was your ancestral land. Big deal. No one wants you there today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. Really. So what happens is, the thing that comes with you, your deeds, your deeds come in the form of people. Sometimes the hadith has different descriptions. The, the deeds come in the form of a protection for you. That's your deed. That's your deed. What did you do? This man, this is his zakah. This is his salah. Beautiful salah. We don't want a quality that is useless. Subhanallah. You know, there was a time when we used to think that the quality of items made in China is not good, but that's wrong. It depends how much you are ready to pay for an item. Ask those who've done business. There was a time when I, I didn't know any better. I was corrected by someone who is Chinese here in this crowd. Subhanallah. Who corrected me. They sent me an email to say, hey, hey, what you said was insulting. It was wrong. You cannot say Chinese products are bad. And they're not. And I, I, I guarantee you that it depends on how much you pay. And also on Allah's acceptance. You know, sometimes you buy a vehicle, very expensive one, but it happens to be slightly faulty. Well, that you paid for a lovely car, the fault that was just a test for you, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one planned it for you to have that particular item. It was Allah's plan. The same applies. You see how much you're ready to pay. That's the type of goods you get. So if you want to buy a light and the light is uh, one dirham, then perhaps it will last for a day, two days, and then it will go. You know, uh, I don't know if you recall the story I told you about a man who only paid uh, one cent for the fans that he had. So he bought a whole box of these fans and he tested one, his wife tested one. And as she held, you know, the, the, the fan that opens up, as he held the first fan, it broke. Or his wife held it and it broke. The wife held the second one, it broke. Third one, it broke. So the wife calls him and says, hey, hey, relax. You bought this thing here and these are breaking. They are defects, rejects. We have a wedding coming up. We wanted to distribute these things to all the guests. How, how did you do this? So he took the boxes and he went back. And he went back to the man on the side of the road selling these boxes. And he says, hey, these things are not working. He says, what do you mean they're not working? They're breaking. The man says, how much did you pay? He says, I paid a cent each. I bought the whole box, you know, so many boxes, four boxes. I paid a cent each. So the man says, oh, there are other ones that come for a dirham and another one that comes for 10 dirhams. It depends how much you pay. Did you read the instructions? The ones you paid, the sent ones. Did you look at the, what it says inside there? He said, no. Well, there's a way of using them. You want to pay a, one cent, you must know how to use it. So the man says, well, how? This is a fan. It's normal. The whole world knows you open the thing and mashallah, it gives you a nice design and then you use it, you know, with your hand. He says, no, 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 no. Those are the ones for a dirham. The one for one cent is a different way. So what's the way? He says, come, I show you. Okay, hold it in your hand. He holds it in his hand. He opens the thing and it's, you know, the fan comes out, beautiful picture. He says, now put it in front of your face. He says, okay, put it in front. Now move your head. <laughs> so he, the man says, what do you mean? He says, but that's if you want to pay nothing, you've got to know how to use it. 
You want the ones that you move, you must pay a bit more. Do you know what? With our deeds, sometimes, sometimes our deeds are not, the sincerity, the quality is not good enough. May Allah forgive us. So take a look at Surah Al-Mulk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Tabaraka alladhi biyadi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadeer. Alladhi khalaqa al-mawta wal-hayata liyabluwakum ayyukum ahsanu amala. Wa huwa al-aziz al-ghafoor. We know we read Surah Al-Mulk so often, people know it off by heart. Listen to that second verse. Allah says, it is he who has created death and life for a certain reason. What's the reason? In order to test who has better deeds from amongst you. He didn't say who has more deeds. Because what's the point of doing more deeds when the quality is like that one cent fan? What's the point? I'd rather do less deeds with a quality that when I need the fan and the cooling, I will be cool, subhanallah. So this is why remember, it, your farad is your farad. You cannot compromise that. Your obligation, you cannot compromise. But that which is excess and more than that, the quality is more important than the quantity. If you have read the Quran properly and thoroughly and covered it within the span of a month, and you did it correctly, beautifully, trying to understand its meaning and so on, it is far more valuable than whipping through it and telling people, I complete one Quran every third day or every day and so on. If you want to read rakaat of salah and offer voluntary salah, it is far better for your preparation for the afterlife if you were to offer less with quality than offering more with quantity and no quality. If you can do both, alhamdulillah, quality and quantity, that is a success. But if you cannot do the quantity of it, remember it's the quality that counts. These are the deeds. This is preparation for the afterlife. Because when we get to our graves, that salah that we did last minute, you know, it happens every day. Hey, it's Asr. What time is sunset? Okay, sunset is at uh, 5.31, for example. So we say, okay, it's still five, five o'clock. I still got a bit of time. And we're still finishing a game, watching a movie, doing some brother, stop everything. The time of uh, uh, the time started at three something, 3.35, whatever the time was, you need to put aside everything and read your salah. We always say, tell your work. Don't say, don't say, oh salah, I have work. Say, oh work, I have salah. Quit it. The women folks, sometimes they're cooking for you. Because sometimes we come roaring home like a lion. I'm hungry. Have you heard that? I'm hungry. What is there to eat? Hey, poor woman is reading Salatul Asr. And we're shouting. Relax. Take it easy. Go and make yourself an egg, inshallah. That egg is more blessed than you screaming in this way while she's trying to earn her Jannah. My sister, don't compromise your Salah for cooking. Don't compromise your Salah for something else. No. Stop everything. Your salah is your grave. You know why? Your life might stop at that moment. That salah will come and save you. You will get into the afterlife before you know. People say, but you know, my children, they are this, they are that. Read the sunnah, ask the ulama, find out how to fulfill your salah. If your children are troubling you a little bit here and there, you fulfill your salah. Subhanallah. Make sure that you've done it. There is no excuse. May Allah grant us ease. Now I'm just thinking there might be some people thinking, okay, I'm intentionally going to make a nice long salah, you know, without having cooked. And then I will say, didn't you hear the talk last night? <laughs> didn't you hear I was busy with my salah? Didn't you hear the talk last night? So remember to strike the balance. You know, we are not saying don't abuse things in order to do something that you, you want to or not to do something that you have to. Don't abuse things. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So the preparation is such that every one of us, common logic will tell us, I need to prepare. Common sense. But sometimes Allah says, Kalla bal al -ajilata wa al -akhirah. Nay, you love the, that which is in front of you now, that which is current, you, you love it. And you are forgetting that which is coming. And this happens to all of us. What's in front of us, we want it. And what is coming, we forget. Allah says, strike the balance. Use the current in order to prepare for that which is coming. May Allah make it easy for us. My brothers and sisters, what a beautiful evening. Do you think we're going to see another evening like this? Possible, but maybe not. 
So before we get to the next evening, before we get home, we ask Allah to forgive us. Ya Allah, forgive our sins. Ya Allah, the day you take us away, be happy with us. You know, we say, oh Allah, forgive all those who've passed away and forgive me the day you take me away as well. We are all going there. Before you know it, there will be a whole new generation. This institution will be run by totally different faces. This whole entire nation will be done, run by totally different faces, progeny upon progeny, whoever Allah has chosen, but they will be totally different people. The evidence of it is few hundred years back, they were totally different people, you know? And what happened? Allah's plan is such that those who planted a good seed in this world, they have reaped the benefit of it even after they have died. That's a way to prepare for the afterlife is, and this is something important, a way to prepare for the afterlife is to do something that will be a continual charity in your life. So what I do, I contribute towards a school, I contribute towards a borehole, I try and disseminate some knowledge, I teach people, I spend a bit of time, money, I spend some of my uh, health, you, you know, the energy Allah has given me to do something, I plant some trees, after I've died, I still reap the reward of anyone who's benefited from the fruit of that tree, from the shade of the tree, from that beautiful school, from whatever I've taught them, these are beneficial ways of preparing for the life after death. This is a beneficial way. But a lot of us are guilty of doing something. What is that? Oh, I need to make Hajj, but I've heard that it's so busy and packed those days. Don't worry. It's okay. I'll leave some money. One of the people who I leave behind will probably make Hajj Badal on my behalf. So we leave it. But brother, you were alive. You could have done it. The duty was yours. Then we say, okay, I've got a debt. You know, now when I die, my people will pay it. Watch out. Pay it in your life. Do you know that if you have a debt that, is, that you've been given a time to pay, it's actually a good deed. That if you've got the wealth to pay it in advance, just pay it. Sort it out now. If you die without the debt, you stand a better chance of entering Jannah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease and goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I think I've spoken for longer than expected. Mashallah, the brothers were asking me, how long are you going to speak for? And they told me, you know, the night is young. And I told them, well, I'm not young. So let's see how long we can speak for, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala